Welcome to the Real Life English Podcast, where we help dedicated English learners just like you cultivate the courage, the confidence, and the skills that you need to understand real life native English, to communicate clearly with people from all around the world, and to make your life an epic global adventure. Now, are you ready to go beyond the classroom and start living your English? Can I get an aww yeah? In this week's podcast, we're talking about some weird and interesting facts about British culture. Ethan and I discuss these as well as any similarities or differences in American culture. Do you think there will be more similarities or differences between the two? Find out now and then head on over to our Instagram at reallife.english to hear three bonus facts that are not included in this list. Aw uh, yeah, boys and girls, citizens of the world, this is Ethan from Real Life English, where we believe that listening to podcasts is a fun, natural, convenient, and astonishing way to learn English. So download this podcast and listen to it while you're taking a stroll in the park, having a lovely cup of tea, or even baking some muffins. Oh uh, yeah, I'm joined here in the global studio, or the Barcelona studio, maybe, by the lovely Andrea. How's it going, Andrea? I'm great, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. So we're doing something kind of special with this podcast because we are actually also providing video for it. So if you want to go over to YouTube, to our channel Real Life English, you'll be able to watch us and it'll be a little bit like you're joining Andrea and I for a casual real life conversation. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is something completely new for us. So it'll be great to see how it turns out. Yeah, it might not be perfect, but... You guys can definitely give us feedback and we'll continue improving on it. Um, and we're not actually together in person today, so it's kind of a virtual, but we're both on, on camera, so you'll be able to see us. And today we are talking all about culture, right? We're going to talk about mostly some British cultural aspects that might be surprising or interesting for you. And most of these, because uh, a lot of American history came from the UK, a lot of our culture is the same. So I think most of these will apply to the US as well, but we'll also talk about any differences. So you're going to be getting a lot of insight into both American and British culture. Exactly. So it'd be really interesting to see which ones are quite similar and maybe which ones are quite different, but definitely a fun one for you to find out more about both cultures. So grab a cup of tea or a cup of joe and we'll roll into today's shout out. What's a cup of joe? A cup of joe is, would you use that in the UK? It's a cup of coffee. Yeah, we don't use it in the UK, no, but I'm aware of it probably from watching TV series. <laughs> cup of joe. So that said, we have a very special shout out for one of our listeners. So today's shout out comes from 2D from Poland, and it's a five star review, of course, and titled My Dears, which I think is very sweet. And she says, you are my best workout partners since a few months ago. I'm so glad you came up with this podcast and you do such a great job. Not a single episode was amiss. All of your talks are so useful and helpful. I've learned a lot from you, especially that everybody can make mistakes. We simply cannot let them stop us. We just have to use them wisely. Oh, yeah. That's a really great message at the end that she gave us, or he. I'm actually not sure. But that everybody makes mistakes and you shouldn't let them stop you. Yeah, I'm so glad that this fan has said this as well because we do talk about not being afraid to make mistakes a lot in our lessons on YouTube and on the podcast so it's great that you're actually taking this on board and you know learning from them that's a great attitude to have couldn't agree more and that said if you want us to shout you out it's really simple just head over to Apple Podcasts Stitcher or wherever you're listening to us and leave us a five-star review and the fantastic thing is that when you do this You're helping other people from all around the world to learn English with us to overcome their fear of making mistakes and to speak confidently So that said we have a very cool quote to share with you today So it was quite tricky to choose an appropriate quote today just because I think there were so many that I could have chosen But the one I have is from Bill Bryson, who is quite a famous American-British travel writer and author. And the quote is, 
The tea room lady called me love, all the shop ladies called me love, and most of the men called me mate. I hadn't been here 12 hours and already they loved me. That's so hilarious because that's like quintessentially British. I think the using those terms, you won't really find that so much in the US. No, exactly. And I think that's what's so sweet about it is it just, when I read it, it just reminded me of going to a shop there and people being like, how are you, love? Are you all right, love? And how can I help (laughs) you, love? And, you know, people calling each other mate and just it being very British and people being quite friendly. So do people say that because they actually love you? So no, they don't say it because they actually love you. Because obviously, if you've just met someone, it's just like a term of endearment. It's like saying dear or how are you, darling, or love and things like that. It's just um, quite a a nice way to greet someone. Yeah. And I think this might be, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it might often be used by like older women. Yeah, definitely. I think, and I'm just thinking here, it's like sometimes when you go to shops in Spain, people call you like cariño or things like this. Guapo, guapa. Yeah, or reina and and things like that. (laughs) And, you know, it's just a sweet thing to do. And I, I I would agree that probably the older generation tend to use it more rather than the youngsters. Yeah, I think in the alternative in the US might be to say dear, as you said. Mm-hmm. So you might like go into a shop or something and or a cafe and maybe the the waitress or the person in charge there might say, how are you, dear? What can I get for you, dear? Yeah, yeah, it's so sweet. <laughs> so that said, uh, that definitely reminds me of when I was traveling in the UK and like going to a tea room. So if you go to the UK, don't be scared. Don't think that the, the old lady at the tea room is coming on to you but just it's a very sweet way of referring to people yeah what does that mean coming on to you someone is coming on to you they're flirting with you they're showing that they're romantically interested in you yeah so don't worry that's not what's happening (laughs) (laughs) so that said we're going to jump into talking a lot more about british and american culture all right andrea what is the first thing that you would want people to know about british culture So one that's really important is that you should never push into a queue in the UK because we respect queues and we don't push in. It's very impolite. But do you call this a queue? Like just in case not everyone understands what I mean by queue. Yeah, I was going to say this definitely culturally, it's the same rule, but that the way that you said it push into a queue sounds extremely British. We would say to cut in line. That makes sense. Yeah, so we'd say like no cuts. Okay, yeah, so we would say don't jump the queue, don't queue jump. Mm -hmm. And, you know, English people love a queue and they (laughs) love order. And I guess I'm the same because when I first moved here, that was something that I struggled with because it wasn't really the same here culturally. And I remember going into like a bakery Mm -hmm. and it was really busy And I kind of waited and then people were going out and I kept moving forward, but then people were coming in behind me and then the staff were just like, who's next, who's next? And everyone was just like, me, me. And it was like, people could see that I was there in front of them, but they didn't care. And I found that quite strange, but then obviously I got used to it. Especially you're quite British, quite polite, and you probably wouldn't say anything about someone jumping the queue in front of you. I know, and (laughs) at that At that time as well, I I couldn't speak the language either, so I couldn't really say anything. So I got quite frustrated. And I must admit, there were a couple of times where I just walked out of the shop because (laughs) I was so frustrated. I was like, I'm not going to buy anything here. It's it's not right what they're doing. That's horrendous. So (laughs) definitely, if you're in the UK or the US, that is something you should absolutely not do because people will not tolerate it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really frowned upon. It's considered very impolite. What does that mean to frown upon something? If you frown upon something, you look down on it. So you're not impressed by it. And yeah, people might not say anything, but they might kind of give you a dirty look or tut because they disapprove <laughs> with with your behavior. What did you say? A tut? Yeah. You know that sound like they go, do you do that? <laughs> I, we do do that. I don't know. I didn't know that was called a tut. Oh, yeah, that's what we call it, tutting. 
That said, what's the next cultural thing people should know about? This one is just so British. It's that we love to talk about the weather and we mainly do it because the weather in the UK is so unpredictable. And, you know, not only do we talk about the weather, but often we're complaining about the weather as well because it's just never quite right for us. I mean, when it's winter, we're complaining that it's freezing and we can't wait until summer. And then when summer comes, we don't usually have a proper summer. We usually have a couple of weeks maybe where there's a heat wave and it's too hot and then everyone's complaining that it's too hot. <laughs> so we're always talking about the weather. Yeah, I remember uh, last time I went to the UK, it was August. And, and I was, I was living here in Barcelona and it's like, obviously here in Barcelona, August, it's sweltering heat. It's like, you can't practically go outside unless you're at a pool or, or at the beach. And I went from that to being in near uh, Cambridge and having to be with like in my aunt's living room with like a blanket over me while I was working because I was freezing. Yeah, that's exactly, that's British summertime. <laughs> yeah. I think this is something too, uh, at least in Colorado, it's quite a big topic because uh, people say if you don't, in Colorado, if you don't like the weather, wait 15 minutes because it just changes so quickly. We're up in the mountains and it can be also like quite unpredictable in that way. Yeah, I know because my sister lived there as well and she used to talk <laughs> about it quite a lot as well. So I think in the US too, maybe because it's so big, that could also be a big topic because you'll have like very differing weather depending on where you're finding yourself in the country. Yeah, that's true. That said, uh, if you are traveling in the UK or the US, that's kind of great to know that it can kind of be like a go-to. If you don't know what else to talk about with someone, you can always bring up the weather. Definitely, because I, I find myself doing it so much. I try not to as much these days, but it tends to be like one of the first things I speak about. <laughs> it's a bad habit, right? Yeah. So what's number three? Okay, so number three is, well, in keeping with talking about the weather, it's very common to travel abroad. So many Brits do travel abroad, especially for a two week summer holiday. Like this is something that people really look forward to. And people tend not to travel in Britain as much just because the weather is so unreliable because I suppose maybe now with COVID and everything, more people are traveling around the UK. But generally, we wouldn't because you might go down to Cornwall, which is very beautiful. I haven't visited, but it's got nice beaches. It's very beautiful, but you, you're not guaranteed sunshine or good weather. Mm. So people will travel to other parts of Europe, especially for their summer holiday by the beach with lots of sun. I think that they have kind of a bad reputation in Spain because it's like coming down here, going to the beach, partying and getting drunk and maybe not respecting so much the local life. Yeah, definitely in the south of Spain, there are lots of people that, that go there into the islands, I suppose, as well. Yeah. But the good thing there is you go in a uh, kind of touristic place in Spain, you can get a good British breakfast. That's true, because that's very important. That's another huge part of the culture is the, the English breakfast. And the same for the Americans. I think it's pretty similar. Like you could be pretty happy, I think, as a Brit going to the U.S., or an American going to UK with breakfast, but you come to most parts of Europe and it's like, you know, toast with jam or a cookie or a croissant or something like that. And you're like, this, this is it. I need, I need more. I need some protein. Yeah. And I, I see that on a lot of menus, actually, like the English breakfast and then the American breakfast. And it's usually that the American one has pancakes added to everything mm. else, I suppose, because that's very traditional. That makes sense. Or I think maybe we're bigger on bacon and maybe in the UK you're bigger on what is it? Bangers and mash? Oh, bangers and mash. Yeah. But that's more like a, a dinner. <laughs> oh, is it? Um, okay. Yeah. You, you will have bacon in an English breakfast, but you do, mm -hmm. like you said, bangers. Bangers are basically sausages. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, this, uh, this English breakfast has sausages, bacons, hash browns, beans. Yeah. The tomatoes. baked beans. That's very British. The baked beans mm -hmm. with breakfast that you won't find in American breakfast. Yeah. So that was kind of like a bonus one. But talking about travel <laughs> uh, for the U.S., it's kind of similar. I mean, most people, we, we have less holidays. I mean, the U.S. is kind of famous for that, that uh, mm -hmm. in general, we're given less paid time off. Uh, but people, especially if they have kids or whatever, you will take some trip. But what's really common in the U.S. is the concept of a road trip. Okay, so can you explain that a little bit to us? So a road trip, because it comes from road, it comes from like the street that you're going in your car. So because the U.S. probably it's such a big country, also gasoline is much cheaper in the U.S. than it is in a lot of other 
uh, countries or petrol, as you would say, right? Petrol, yeah. So being that it's quite, that makes it quite cheap to travel and we're very big car culture. So a lot of people, you know, might drive down to, to Florida or down to uh, California or Mexico even, which is another country, but it's, it's like quite close by depending where you are and spend your, your holiday there. So would you say that people tend to travel abroad less and go on road trips just because of this, because it's so easy to travel? And also, I guess the US is is such a huge country and you have like all different climates all around and Mm -hmm. so many, like you have the beach, the mountains, like you can find everything in the country. So would you say that people tend to just travel in the US a lot more? Yeah, like you might, especially depending what you're interested in, like maybe you'll go to a national park, like we have so many incredibly beautiful national parks in the US. And and I think too, like for retirement, something that's really American is like people will buy like an old couple that's retired is they'll buy an RV, a recreational vehicle, and they'll travel all around the country going to like all the national parks and kind of seeing it because, you know, you could spend years just traveling around the US and there's just so much to see because it's such a big country. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, it is. It's so vast. There's just so much land, isn't there? Exactly. So it's kind of like Europe in the same sense that like probably for you guys jumping down to Spain, for example, from the UK is a little bit for us, like going from New York to Florida. That's exactly it, isn't it? I guess that's, that's why it's so nearby and the climate is so different that it just makes sense to travel in Europe. Mm -hmm. Totally. So that said, what's the next one? So the next one is that it's impolite to arrive to someone's house without an invitation. So what you should do is call beforehand just to see if that person's home and if it's a good time to pop around so that you don't arrive unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So you said pop around. What does that mean? Yeah. (laughs) So it's like a quick visit. We would just say like, oh, I'm just going to pop around or I'm going to pop in and say mm-hmm. hello and see you. So it just means that you're, you'll you just go around for not very long, probably not more than an hour, just a short visit. Mm-hmm. We would probably say also pop in, but not pop around or like drop by. I'm just gonna drop by and drop something off mm-hmm. maybe. <laughs> yeah, we would we would say the same as well. I think the first thing that just came to my mind there was pop, mm-hmm. pop in, pop around. Um, but we would say drop by maybe or or drop something off for sure if you're gonna go to a friend's house and say oh you left this here the other day I'm just gonna pass by and I'll drop it off Mm -hmm. pass by that's another one yeah I think if you are in the US or the UK it's probably within most cultures there it's probably quite rude just to like show up unexpectedly just popping in and, and not even calling or anything beforehand yeah, everyone does it. I mean, you can even call and say, oh, are you home? I can come around in half an hour or 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. I think you would say, do you say half an hour? Yeah, half an hour. I think, okay. what is it you guys say? Um, half past two. We'd say that as well. And like things like that. You you do have something that's different though. I can't I can't think of it right now. It's something to do with the time, mm-hmm. how how we say the time. But um, yeah, so, you know, you don't have to call them and say, can I come around tomorrow? It can still be on the same day, but it's just polite to do so. Exactly. So I think that's a really good thing to know to, you know, not be burning any bridges with your friends. If you're going to the US or the UK or probably any English speaking country, you shouldn't be doing any pop-ins. Definitely. What was that you said there, burn any bridges? Burn any bridges. So if you burn a bridge, it's kind of like you're ruining a relationship, right? You're doing something that that kind of as if, I guess the relationship was a bridge and you're burning it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So what's the next one, number five? So the next one is funny as well because you'll see it a lot depicted Mm -hmm. in like TV series and movies. And it's that we say please, sorry, and thank you a lot. (laughs) So again, this goes back to politeness, having good manners. But I mean, even if we do something, like if we bump into someone on the train or on the street and it's not our fault, we will say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, are you okay? As as if it is, you know? Yeah, I think like the most... American or like British thing of this, like the the biggest example of that is someone else steps on your foot and you say sorry because you feel like you're inconvenienced them by having been in their way or something like that. 
Exactly. So is this quite similar then in the States? Definitely. I think definitely that over apologizing or just being super polite saying please all the time. And it's like kind of shocking too, because I, I still, when I speak Spanish or Catalan here, I, I say please or like thank you or, you know, sorry, much more than anyone local does just because like that's been ingrained in me since I was a baby that you're supposed to be super polite to everyone. Yeah, I feel the same. I do that a lot as well. And I don't see others around me doing it as much, yeah. but I'm I'm still happy to do it. And you have like, uh, I, I think like a big example here that I'll notice is like on the subway or the bus, not so much nowadays, but before Corona, when you'd have like the crowded public transportation and, you know, people would be bumping into you all the time and like, no one says sorry, but in the US it would, you know, you'd be going probably through the whole car trying to, to enter, trying to exit. And every person you bumped into, you say, sorry, coming through, sorry, give me some space, please. Wouldn't it be great if there was some way to understand real English without getting lost and without getting bored? Well, now there is. With our real life native immersion course, we will take you on a 41 week real life adventure of the English language. Each week exploring a different topic connected to our goal to help you understand and use real native English and make it a permanent part of your life in a way that is fun, natural, and convenient. The best part is you can try it for free with our three part power learning series. We will send it to your email. Just go to reallifeglobal.com slash pod, that's P-O-D, to sign up. Now, let's get back to today's podcast lesson. Okay, so the next one is to do with washing machines. And I don't know how different this is in lots of different countries, but our washing machines are kept in the kitchen. And this is usually due to lack of space. And I've heard that this is quite unusual in other countries, especially in some states in the US where people probably have more space because I've, I, I think I remember my sister and my aunt, they both had like a utility room or like a laundry room. And in the UK, most people don't tend to have this, like unless you have a really big house. Yeah. I think that that's definitely, uh, definitely one of the ones that's a big difference between the US and the UK, the US and most countries we have in the US, tons of space. And this is something like culturally, or just when you visit there, it's like something that you notice right away, like everything's bigger. Like we have most cities you go to, you just have these humongous parking lots, like parking is almost never a problem unless maybe you're in like New York or, you know, right downtown in, in some big city. In general, it's like parking is very, very easy to find because there's, there's these big parking lots, there's parking garages. And um, then also you'll see like things like this, like you're saying, most people live in a house and most people have more space than they even could ever need. And so it's like, for example, you'll have a laundry room and you have, uh, you have a washer, but something I think else that's really different about the U S is we have a dryer. Like, I don't know if I've ever met anyone in the U S who did hang drying and like here it's exactly the opposite. It's very rare to see someone with a dryer. Like we have here, um, also the washer in the kitchen, but uh, we have like a washer dryer, like two in one, and we like never use the dryer. It's like we always hang dry because I imagine just because like the weather here, it's always so sunny uh, and stuff that it's it's pretty easy to hang dry and it saves money. So I guess that's the other thing too in the US is that resources like electricity are a lot cheaper than in Europe, for example. So we'll use like the dryer and like we'll use the, the machines a lot more. We're not so worried about like wasting because it's like a lot cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, because in the UK, like in the first house that I grew up in, it was quite big. So we did have a washer and a dryer. But then when we moved to a smaller house, we just had a washing machine. So we would hang the clothes out outside to dry. And here in, in Spain as well, obviously, I'm living in a flat or an apartment. Um, but many people here, well, right now, our washing machine is in our kitchen here as well. Mm -hmm. But many people here have a utility balcony, don't they, where... Mm -hmm. It's, you know, they have like where the, where the boiler is and a sink and many people have their washing machine on that balcony as well. Yeah. And they'll, a lot of times they'll have like the actual window there that opens onto like either the, the interior patio or maybe the exterior and, and they'll uh, hang their clothes right there. Exactly. So I think that's, that's a big difference is like in the US, you'd never have a lack of space. 
And in the UK, I imagine probably dryers are a little bit more popular, maybe because of the weather. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, if you have the space in your house, many people will have it. It's just down to lack of space, usually. Mm -hmm. um, many people don't have it just for that reason, but it's really useful because you have to really check the weather forecast. And if you're drying your clothes outside, you have to make sure it's not going to rain because suddenly it just might happen and then <laughs> there go all your clothes. <laughs> All right, so what's the next one? So the next one is that if you're invited to someone's house for a dinner or a party, it's polite to take a gift, such as a box of chocolates or a bottle of wine or some flowers. It's rude to go empty-handed. And I mean, you might even ask the person, oh, shall I bring anything? And they'll say, no, don't worry, ju you just come. But really, it's polite to take something because they're hosting you. Yeah, I think that that's... That definitely is something too that you'll kind of find in the US. Um, I don't know if like a box of chocolates would be so common, but if you're going for dinner, certainly like wine would be very common, or maybe you would bring like a plate or uh, or something else that could be very common is like you might bring the dessert. If the other person's going to cook the dinner, mm -hmm. then you bring maybe some ice cream or something for dessert. Yeah, we do the same. That's often what we would do, like with family and friends. We'd say, oh, would you like me to bring a dessert? Mm -hmm. And then that's that's something you could do. But if you were just going like maybe for like a pop-in or I don't know, uh, like something informal, would it still be pretty common for you to bring something? You don't have to. It's not going to be considered impolite or anything. Um, I might just say to my friend like, oh, if I'm going around for a cup of tea, which we mm -hmm. would often do, oh, I'm going to pop around for a cup of tea. Shall I bring anything? And my friend might say, oh, no, don't worry. Just bring yourself. But I might still take some biscuits or, um, you know, something to have with the tea. That makes sense. Yeah. And in the, in the US, I think it's almost only if it's like a dinner or something like that. But like in, in other cases, it wouldn't be so common. Well, in keeping with talking about food, on Sundays, it's typical for families to eat a roast dinner. Mm -hmm. And so this includes some form of meat, roasted meat, like beef maybe, or chicken and potatoes and Yorkshire puddings and veg, vegetables and gravy. And most people cook it at home, but lots of people do also go to the pub for a pub lunch on a Sunday because mm -hmm. they always serve a roast dinner. Wow, that sounds really good. So what's a Yorkshire pudding? I think I understood everything except for that. Oh, they are so good, Ethan. You have to try it. It's like the best part of a roast dinner. <laughs> so it's not actually a pudding, which is quite interesting. It's not a dessert or anything sweet. It's just, it's usually like uh, flour and some oil and what else is in it? Maybe egg. And it's just kind of like a, I don't know how to describe it. How would you describe a Yorkshire pudding? It's kind of like a pastry kind mm. of thing. And so it's a side dish of a roast dinner and you pour gravy over it. So it's quite crispy. And then when you pour gravy over it, it softens it a little bit. And oh, they're so delicious. It sounds a little bit like what we would call a biscuit in the US because you have like biscuits and gravy in the US that's like a kind of like a salty baked good that you would have like um, with with gravy on top of it. And you'd have it like a lot of times maybe the same like with some meat or something like that. So you'd have like the gravy all over the place. That makes sense. It's probably quite similar. I think the only thing is are biscuits a bit more dense? Are they a bit mm -hmm. thicker and heavier? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yorkshire puddings are quite light, so you can eat lots of them. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to find one of those and try it. I know somewhere here. We'll find them and you'll get to try <laughs> them. <laughs> that sounds delicious. So that uh, wouldn't be such a common thing in the US. I think maybe like Sunday family dinner, that could be kind of, especially if you kind of like come from a more traditional family, probably a lot of people do that. But um, I don't think there's any like particular, like you have to have a roast or something. It would just be whatever food and it's kind of more the idea of coming together mm -hmm. but i think something maybe similar to that that a lot of people i found are really fascinated by is thanksgiving dinner mm -hmm. that we have in the u.s that's like a very typical thing that's the third thursday in every november so that's coming up and of course we have like the turkey and i think people seeing that in the movies and stuff it's just like it seems amazing for them that people are cooking an entire turkey in their in their house and then you know you have like all these different plates it's like um, that are kind of like the typical things you'd have like 
green beans and mashed potatoes with gravy too. You have like the, that's one of my favorite parts is like the mashed potatoes and you put lots of gravy on mm. them or like um, some other strange things like cranberry sauce. That's very typical, like a sauce that we make from cranberries, which are very bitter. And so it's kind of like with sugar and like sometimes mandarins or something like that. And you have many different plates like this that are very typical that it's like you have to have with your Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah, see, we have that at Christmas. So usually mm-hmm. our Christmas dinner is a turkey and we have cranberry sauce as well. But then mm-hmm. do you eat something else traditionally usually on Christmas Day, not a turkey? I think my family has always eaten turkey. Okay. But uh, I think something else really typical that you'll find, more more typical than turkey, would be like a roasted ham. Mm. So, yeah, I've heard about this as well. So more people would have a turkey on Thanksgiving and then a ham at Christmas. The Christmas ham. Exactly. The Christmas ham. That's it. Yeah. (laughs) Nice. Definitely. I think like Thanksgiving, if you can ever have like a Thanksgiving dinner, that's really fun. But it sounds like if you go to the UK, maybe it's a little bit easier. It's just any Sunday. You have to get invited to a friend's house. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there'll be some Sundays where where you don't do it and you don't have to have a roast dinner every Sunday, but it is mm-hmm. quite a bit of a tradition. So I remember growing up, because my family's Greek Cypriot, my dad used to cook a lot of other dishes, but then sometimes we hadn't had a roast dinner in a while. So we'd be like, oh, should we have a roast this Sunday? And that's what we would have. <laughs> and roast is like in the oven, right? Yeah. You roast something in the oven. Okay. Yeah. So, and what what is it exactly that you're roasting? Is it pork or? So chicken or beef is quite common in the UK. Some people maybe might have roast lamb, but not as frequently. Mm -hmm. It would usually probably be beef or chicken. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So what's next? Okay, so the next one, I think you mentioned it a little bit earlier when we were talking about traveling for holidays, but there is quite a big drinking culture. So it's very normal to see people drink a lot on a night out on a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah, Brits have a lot of fame for this in, I think, here in Spain. But uh, I think, too, you guys have got like a very big pub culture. And I know here in Spain, the thing that people are very surprised about by Brits is like you start so early. That like maybe you have dinner at like five probably or six. Yeah, about six o'clock. And so like when would you start like if you're having dinner and then like you're going to get together with your friends, when would you start like drinking typically? If you're going to the pub, maybe some people will get there for seven because I mean, we don't tend to stay out as late as well. Obviously now there's a curfew, Mm -hmm. but before like pubs would close way before midnight you know it's, I've, I haven't lived there for so long now I've forgotten like maybe at 11 or, or midnight so I think what happens is in the UK people tend to maybe drink for longer like you said and also not stop so maybe they're starting to get tim- tipsy or a little bit drunk and you know they carry on so then that's when they maybe get quite drunk and I think this is improving a little bit but it does still exist yeah. In in the US, it's probably pretty similar. I mean, definitely people like going out on a Friday or Saturday. Um, and definitely it's kind of the same that since the bars close at 2 a.m. in the US, it's actually I think it, it differs state to state. But in general, I think it's something around that like 2 a.m. So it's kind of like, you know, there's not a whole lot to do after that. Maybe you can find maybe you can go to like a club or something that might be open a little bit later. But in general, the party kind of ends at 2 a.m. So you know, most people start maybe around 8 p.m. I think would be pretty typical. Okay, so quite similar. And I think for us, maybe the kind of something similar might be like kind of the college reputation, you know, like college parties. And um, I think after that, of course, there's people who still get drunk, but I think most people after college, their drinking goes down a lot. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So after that, what's number 10? So the next one is that we find it rude if people talk loudly on their phone on public transport. And I guess this is because we're thinking about the other people that we're sharing the space with. And so people won't say anything to you. They'll probably just maybe give you a bit of side eye or give you a dirty look and maybe tut as well, but they (laughs) won't confront you over it, but it's frowned upon like you mentioned earlier. Okay, so we just have two more, and then we're actually going to have a few 
bonus ones that we'll share with you over on our Instagram. So be sure to head over there afterwards to learn a little bit more cultural faux pas, things that you shouldn't do. And the number 11, right? I think actually we've done probably more than we actually have here because we've we've talked about some extra ones, but <laughs> more or less the 11th one. More or less, yeah. So the next one is actually that we don't tip that much. We would maybe tip about 10% depending on the overall bill. Um, but there are some more like posh, expensive London restaurants that would add a discretionary service charge to your bill of 12.5%. But it is discretionary, so that means that you don't have to pay it. So when the bill comes, you could say, I'm just paying the bill. And then people tend to just leave some cash instead, because that way, I think people are more secure in the knowledge that maybe the waiter or the waitress is actually getting the tip as well by not just paying it all on a card or something like that, for example. Yeah, I think it probably depends who you ask. Like we don't tip that much. (laughs) I mean, uh, in the UK, because probably compared to here, for example, they probably like that you guys tip a ton, 10% or 12%, 12%. But in the US, of course, like that doesn't seem like hardly anything. Like if you give someone a 10% tip, they'll feel insulted. Like there was something really wrong with the service and in general europeans have kind of a bad rap in the u.s when they go to restaurants if they're working as like a if you're working as a waiter or a waitress because they're really bad tippers because it's just like a a cultural thing but in the u.s it's really important it's it's really really important that you pay at least a 15 to 20 percent tip because the waiter or waitress their salary is very low because it's expected that a large part of their salary will come from tips so also i think a big cultural difference that you'll notice when you go to the us at least compared for example to uh, most places in europe is that the service is excellent unless in most places you go to you'll find like really really great service they um, will come over to you a lot and ask how you're doing and how, how the food is uh, your drink will never be empty. They always come and ask. That's something that really frustrates me here is like yeah. you have to call the waiter to be like, can you yeah. please give me like another drink or something? And in the US, it's like, unless you go to a really bad place, you'll never have to do that. So um, obviously it's a trade-off. It's nice here not having to ever really pay a tip unless you're going somewhere really fancy. Uh, but in the US, on the other hand, you have really terrific attention. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, here people, like you said, they don't really tip at all. So sometimes when we've been out with friends, we're like, oh, what should we leave? And they're like, what do you mean leave? We're not leaving anything. And we're like, oh, but we have to leave a tip. And they're like, no, we don't do that here. But then we feel bad. So, you know, we'd at least leave a couple of euros or or something like that. And depending on on the overall bill like we we wouldn't tip like mm-hmm. 20 pounds or something like that because in the US like you sometimes have to tip 20 dollars yeah, yeah. <laughs> or more yeah but in the UK like if you go out for a meal maybe four of you and it's not too expensive maybe it's 100 pounds then you know you might leave like 5 pounds some people might leave yeah. 10 pounds but that's quite a lot so in those cases it will be less than 10% yeah in the, in the US it it just depends on like how big your bill is is how big the the tip should be because it's always kind of like thought that 15 to 20% um but like really cuz cuz it seems like a lot when you're when obviously you're thinking I, I have like this bill and it costs this much and then I have to add this onto there. But like really what I just recommend to people, if you're eating out in the US and you know you have to pay a tip, just like, you know, know that it's going to be 15 or 20% more than what you're seeing there on the menu because of the because of the tip. So in that case, you'll kind of like have a better idea of what the actual cost of it is because it's kind of just something that it for us is a part of what you're paying for the meal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that said, we have our final point. We're also going to be talking, I guess, a little bit about money with this one. What is it? Yeah, so at the moment, our university fees are very high. And when I say very high, I mean in comparison to previous years in the UK. So when I went to uni, I think, so (laughs) by uni, I mean university, or you would say college. So we just say uni. Um, When I went to uni, I think for the first two years, Mm -hmm. we didn't have to pay anything there was a period where it was free for everyone. And then in my final year, it had changed. So I think it was like a thousand pounds for the year, Mm -hmm. which is a lot of money, but you know, not compared to now, because now in the last few years it changed and it's 9,000 pounds per year. So. Now, is that like pretty much anywhere you go or is that like 
Is that like kind of a standard? Is it an average? It's actually the standard, I think. Yeah, you wouldn't uh, pay different prices depending on where you go normally in the UK. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if maybe there are some private universities or colleges or things like that maybe where it's different. But generally, if you're going to go to university, then you need at least 27,000 just to pay your fees. Is that the case too if you're going to like Cambridge or Oxford? Because I think I've heard that they're like very expensive universities, for example. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I'm not sure if it's the fees that are more expensive or maybe it's the living mm. costs when you actually, if like if you're living in halls of residence or or things mm -hmm. like that, that then adds costs, maybe the, the books that you need depending on what you're studying. Obviously that then adds up after. And what do you do in the UK if you can't afford that if you don't have like $27,000 that you can pay over those three years, is it pretty typical to take out a loan? Yeah. So, I mean, even if, even before when it was free, lots of people did take out a student loan to help them pay their rent and just to live and things like that as well. So you'd often get maybe a loan of maybe 4,000 a year, something like that. And mm -hmm. I, I remember actually when my sister was at university, she was given a grant. So she didn't have to pay for fees and she was actually given money as well to go to university and wow. to live, which was incredible. But then obviously when the governments change, they bring in new rules. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so people will take out a loan, but then you have a huge loan then to start paying off. So to be honest with you, I think what's happened is that it's deterred people from going to university. Like if you can't afford it, you mm. just can't go, which is such a shame because, you know, I, I even think, I know it's further education, but I think that it should be available for everyone. And that's kind of what I grew up mm -hmm. with and what I was used to. And now that it's changed, it's, it's a real shame. So I think a lot of people actually will then just decide not to go to university because the loan will be too much um, unless they had some sort of scholarship, maybe some universities offer this as well. That makes sense. Yeah, in the, the US, um, it sounds pretty similar, but I think our prices can be even higher. Uh, I paid, I think for me, it was about 4,000 per semester. So that would be like $8,000 per, per year, which I guess is, is less than pounds in fact, but um, but that's it's something that's very strange culturally with the U.S. is it's much cheaper if you go in state. So if you go to a university that's in the same state where where you reside. Um, so for me, that was Colorado, and I went to the University of Colorado, which is a public university. And uh, and you know, based on that, it was that cost. But uh, for people who were from out of state, people who didn't reside in Colorado but wanted to go to the university there. Uh, so, for example, I had a roommate who is from Michigan. He was paying, I think, around forty thousand dollars per year, which is like insane. Wow. Yeah, because that's what I think of. That's that's why I, I didn't I didn't know that if you go in your state, it's a lot cheaper. In my mind, it was always like around thirty thousand mm -hmm. a year or something to go to to college in the U.S. Yeah. It can be very, very expensive. And it depends, like if you go to a private or a public one, if you go to a private, it's much more expensive because I had a friend too who went to Colorado College, which is a private uh, a private college in Colorado. And that one I think was also something like 35 or 40,000 per year. So they have exorbitant fees. But the good thing if you go to a private one out of state, it's the same price whether you're, you're in state or out of state. But I just think like it's the, kind of the same that the prices are are really really absurd yeah it's crazy that's really just to like study and i think we have such a big culture of studying that it's almost like i mean maybe if you're lower class not so much but i think for most people that are like middle class or higher it's really expected that you go to university it's kind of like the weird thing would be not going to university and it's like even kind of like looked down upon frowned upon that you like don't go to university so we definitely think within our culture that that's really important that you that you have a university degree um but the thing with the loans like you were saying is in the usa that's just like very normal you know if, if your parents can't afford to pay for you or grandparents or something like that it's very normal that you take out a loan to pay for university but the thing is like especially over the years kind of like the the fees used to be really low on those loans but now they've gotten higher and so it's like you finish university and you're going to get an entry level job that has like not that great of a salary. And it's like, you're already in debt. You're starting out and, and depending where you go, maybe you'll be 
um, tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt and you'll be like years paying that off like I remember when I was when I was young my dad like had just finished paying off his law school so it's wow. it's really just like this culture of like okay we go to study we have huge loans and it's just like you're spending a lot of your adult life paying off that university uh, the, the those four years or or maybe six years that you were studying at university mm. I know it's it's crazy when you think about it that way. It's scary money to me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, here definitely in Europe where generally like the fees are very low, like maybe a couple thousand dollars, that seems, and, and I think it is quite absurd in the US. But the, the education you get at least, it's like a very good education at most universities. But but still, I think it's a, it's a huge problem. There's a lot of uh, dilemma about that politically different candidates that want to maybe even like pardon student debt or, or find ways to like severely reduce that. So hopefully that will happen. Um, but anyways, that's the 12 things that we had. And I think you got a few extra ones. So maybe that was more like 14, 15. But if you are enjoying this topic and you want to learn even more, then we will upload a video over on our Instagram at reallife.english. And you can learn at least three more things. But you know, we love talking about this, so maybe it'll be even more. So that said, was there anything else that you wanted to bring up, Andrea, before we wrap up? No, I think that was great. And I hope you all enjoyed that and you learned some new facts about our cultures. And might help to save you some face. It might help to make sure you don't burn any bridges or do anything embarrassing when you're in the US or the UK. And remember, if you are listening to this, that you can head over to YouTube and search for our channel, Real Life English. While you're there, be sure to subscribe, but you'll be able to actually join Andrea and I on the conversation and, and watch us and feel a little bit with your cup of tea, like you're having a conversation with us. And if you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to go and listen to the podcast because this is a great way to make it super convenient. Like as our listener that we talked about before, Todi, had said that she loves listening to us while she exercises, but anytime you have a convenient moment, you can whack in your headphones and join us. So uh, it's great being here with you all today, and we'll see you next week on the Real Life English Podcast. One, two, three. Ah, uh, yeah. Don't be a stranger. You can find all the notes like vocabulary, links, and more for this lesson on our blog at reallifeglobal.com and connect with us and on Instagram at reallife.english for even more fun English recommendations. Do you want to continue your learning and get confident, fluent English? Then I have a couple great recommendations for you. First of all, check out our YouTube channel, Learn English with TV series, where you can have fun learning to understand fast speaking natives with your favorite movies, series, and more without getting lost, without missing the jokes, and without subtitles. Second, if you like our podcast, then our real life native immersion course is perfect for you. It is the next best thing to studying abroad in an English speaking country. Try it for free with our three part power learning series. Just go to reallifeglobal.com slash pod to sign up. Finally, if you are enjoying our podcast, then please assist us in helping more people go beyond the classroom and live their English. You can do this by sending a link to this podcast to a friend or by leaving us a five-star review wherever you are listening. We might even shout you out on the podcast. Stay healthy and safe, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Aw, yeah.